All right. Uh, so in principle, this whole seminar series is about classifying topoi. Um, and the reason for that being, uh, so remember, so the aim that I described in the first lecture was to use um, classifying topoi to organize mathematical knowledge. And that put us in the context of the sort of logical angle on topos theory. There's many different ways in which topos theory is used. One of them is within logic. Uh, yes, that's it, full stop. And the way that was supposed to work, as I described in the first lecture, was that we would associate two theories, say the theory of abelian groups or the theory of rings, we would associate to them certain topoi, the classifying topoi. And then the organization part is obviously to do with connections between different concepts, and those manifest themselves uh, in pairs of adjoint functors between these topoi. All right, so if we want to understand this role of classifying topoi, well, actually, um, you know, following the general philosophy of category theory, that it's the morphisms that matter and not the objects, it's really about these functors. Okay. So that means that we need to get some handle on how to think about these functors. And today is about the left adjoint part. Um, and how to think about it. The way to think about it is as a tensor product. So we all know what this means in the setting of algebra, and today we're going to upgrade this intuition <coughs> into a way to think about more general left adjoints uh, in such a way that actually a lot of the sort of conceptual framework you have around tensor products does translate. So for example, geometric realization of a simplicial set is a tensor product. Um, these things which are to do with logical objects like the universal ring and the universal abelian group, nonetheless this is very much like a tensor product and all of the intuitions around both the logical context, the algebra context, and the algebraic topology context, that is geometric realization, there's a common core to all of those, and that's what I'm going to talk about. All right. Um, I want to briefly motivate somehow why we would want to understand this functor in a more concrete way. Uh, I mean, in an abstract sense, I think it's clear from what I said that it's about the morphisms, the morphisms of these functors. We need to understand these functors. But uh, from a more concrete point of view, suppose we actually wanted to implement reasoning about these theories in some computer assistant, uh, which encodes higher order logic, for instance. Um, then we need not just, we need actually effective descriptions of the actions of, say, these functors on morphisms. Okay, so I'm going to say something briefly about that before we get into the discussion of tensor products. Um, well, maybe I should, maybe I should, um, so this is the first of maybe three talks on classifying topoi, and maybe I should repeat what a classifying topos is, uh, just briefly. So, given a theory, in fact a geometric theory T, I haven't defined this term yet, um, so some particular kind of theory T, say abelian groups or rings, uh, a topos B of T is a classifying topos if there's a natural equivalence of categories for every co-complete topos E between the category of geometric morphisms from E to BT. So a geometric morphism between to two topoi is a pair of adjoint functors. Uh, the left adjoint part is typically denoted F upper star, the right adjoint part F lower star, following uh, the, the convention in geometry. So a geometric morphism is such a pair of adjoint functors such that the left adjoint part preserves finite limits. Okay, that's it. 
Now notice, since this has a right adjoint, it preserves all co-limits, but there's no reason for this to preserve any particular limits. Okay, so that's really a condition. Uh, and this should be, so one can make this into a category in a natural way, and on the right-hand side here is models of the theory T in the topos E. So as I said, we'll discuss this. Is that a knock on this door? No. We'll discuss this in some more detail later, but you should think of, for instance, if E was the topos of sheaves on a topological space, just the usual sheaves, um, and T was the theory of abelian groups, this would be exactly the abelian category of sheaves of abelian groups. Okay, so this is sort of a natural thing to do. And B of T classifies the theory if there's a natural, natural in E, natural isomorphism of these two categories as E varies. All right. uh. Okay, so there's some more sort of motivation given in the notes, uh, but I think I'll just jump straight into the tensor products. Um. Well, okay, so maybe Maybe let me add one more piece of detail. Uh, so let's, let's consider, I mean, I, I drew this on the board. So what's a canonical source of an adjoint pair of functors given this universal property in this particular case? Well, in a classifying topos, for the reasons I discussed in the first lecture, there's a universal model of the theory. So there's a universal ring, there's a universal abelian group. And because a ring is an abelian group, The universal ring is a model of the theory of abelian groups in the classifying topos of rings. And so by this uh, universal property, there must be uh, a geometric morphism from B ring to B abelian groups, and I wrote it around the wrong way, didn't I? Okay, so this is awkward now. So the, the canonical geometric morphism I get from the fact that a ring is, a, is an abelian group has its right adjoint part pointing from B ring. left adjoint part pointing from B abelian groups. Okay, so why should we care about having some kind of intuition or effective description of this functor? Okay, so that's the aim of today's lecture. So logically, why do we want that? Well, logically what this functor does is it says, give me a theorem about abelian groups or a construction I can do with abelian groups. Um, such a theorem or a construction is reflected by objects and morphisms of this classifying topos when we think about it logically. This functor then takes those constructions and sends them to constructions or sort of theorems over here in such a way that here the universal abelian group, which is sort of in my theorem, becomes the universal ring. Which is to say, if I have a theorem which is true about abelian groups, which only uses the additive structure, that theorem is also true of rings. Right? Of course, we use that all the time. This functor is what effectively implements that translation. It says, give me a fact about abelian groups. I will then write it down in the case where that abelian group happened to also have a ring structure. Okay, So that's what this functor does at a sort of uh, conceptual level but we're interested in actually seeing that in action. And as I said, to do that, we want to first go back and think about the tensor product uh, in algebra. So that's what we do now. All right. So.
Okay, so let R be a ring, and my rings are associative and unital, but not necessarily commutative. So M right R module, N left R module, then we know that the tensor product, M tensor over R with N, so that's some abelian group. It comes equipped with a map, which describes the tensors from the Cartesian product, and that map, which is just a function, uh, has a universal property, namely it is the universal bilinear map from this Cartesian product into an abelian group. Right, so it's the universal property which defines the tensor product. So that's all a review for this audience. Um, Okay, so the point of the next little bit is to present an alternative universal property which describes the tensor product. Um, there's a reference here, so I learned this stuff from a book of Barry Mitchell, um, Theory of Categories, so I highly recommend that book. Um, some notation. So that's going to mean the category of right R modules. This will be the category of left R modules. <clears throat> um, okay, there's a little bit of variation in the terminology in the literature, so to fix that, let me just say now. So So some people call this pre-additive. So given a category, I'm going to say it's additive. If all the morphism sets are equipped with the structure of an abelian group, and composition is bilinear. Okay, I don't assume this has finite uh, products. Right, that's what some people assume when they say additive. Uh, okay, so that's an additive category. A functor between additive categories is just an ordinary functor, which on the level of home sets is given by a morphism of abelian groups. Right. Okay, so here's a remark. Okay, so we fix the ring. I take the category of right R modules, and then P, curly P, is going to stand for the full subcategory, which is just the R module R. Okay, so R acting on itself by left multiplication. Right, that's the right. Uh, well, sorry. So R is made into a right R module by right multiplication. Um, the left multiplication comes in a second. All right. Uh, okay, so what's an additive functor? I mean, that's clearly an additive category, right? I mean, mod R is an additive category. So what's the data of an additive functor F from this one object category to the category of right R modules for some other ring S? All right, so let's think that through. Well, a functor is two things. It's a collection of, it's a mapping of objects to objects. There's only one object there, namely R. So it's picking out a single S module. So it's the data of a right S module, namely, uh, let's call it B, namely F applied to the single object. And it's a map of home sets. Well, it's an additive functor, so it's a morphism of home abelian groups. So we have a, uh, a morphism of abelian groups from PRR, that is, which is just right R linear maps from R to R. 
uh, but that's just R. Right? So hom R, R, R is R. Be careful though. R here is identified with the map which is left multiplication. Okay. So R goes to the function which is blank. Sorry, R multiplied with blank. Right, because that's right linear, right? If you hit something on the right, it commutes because of associativity. If you multiply it on the right, it wouldn't be right linear. Okay. So R is identified in this way with PRR, and the data of F contains this function, which is F R comma R to well S linear maps from B to B. Okay, so the data of a functor gives us a function like this. It's additive, so it has to be a morphism of abelian groups. The fact that it's a functor means the identity has to go to the identity, and composition, which is multiplication in the ring, has to go to multiplication. Right? So actually the data of an additive functor F is a right S module B and a morphism of rings. Okay, now that is completely capturing the data of such a functor if I say it's a morphism of rings. <coughs> All right, so there's another way of saying what that data is, um, and I'll let you think about what that is as I erase. So what's another way of saying that? Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. You both said the same thing. Right. So IE F is the data of a left R right S by module. Hence the B. <laughs> right? Because think about it. <coughs> well, certainly I've got an action of R on B because I can just send, I mean, that map, if I send R to the map, which is FBB of the R linear map from R to itself, which is left multiplication by R. That is an S linear map from B to B, and I could call that map action by R. Right? And then the fact that it's S linear says exactly that if I define that, that is R acting on an element of B, I define to be this thing. Oh, this is awkward now. Zoop. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mean F R? Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I do. Did I write FRR up there? I did, yeah. All right, so apply that map to R and then <coughs> evaluate that map on B. That's an element of B. Call that R dot B. So S linearity means precisely that R dot B acted on with S is equal to R dot B acted on with S, which is what I need for a bi -mod. So if you think that through, you'll see that it's exactly the condition that we have a bi-module. All right, so additive functors from P to mod S is the same as R S bi-modules. Sorry, Dad, do you mean to have that bracket and it's spot that lower one? <laughs> yes, 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 thanks, thanks. Okay, so well, that's a new way to think about bimodules. So what? Um, so here's a theorem. Yeah. 
Actually, I don't quite know how to tr attribute this. So this version may be part of Eilenberg Watts, uh, but the general statement, which is involving sort of abelian categories and its full power is due to uh, Freed. Anyway, this special case of the theorem says that um, given an additive functor, Same notation as above. Well, we know how to, th that's really a bimodule, right? There is a unique extension of F to a co limit preserving <coughs> functor F bar. So I should be a little careful, as usual, about what unique means. Uh, I'll do that in a second, uh, but I hope extension is, is clear, right? So <coughs> I can draw this diagram. There's P sitting inside mod R. There's mod S. There's my F. There's F bar. And I can ask that you know, this diagram commutes up to natural isomorphism. Extension means that uh, F bar, let's call this iota. Iota is, is F. And unique means up to natural isomorphism. I mean, one can be even, well, one could ask for even more that it's a unique natural isomorphism, but I don't want to get into that. <laughs> okay, so is the statement clear? Yeah? All right. <coughs> All right, so how would we define... I mean, maybe you know an answer to this universal problem, given this section is called tensor products. But let's see if we can discover tensor products by just trying to cook up such a functor f bar. So, I mean, you should be able to, I mean, know in advance what this f bar is. So this is a proof sketch. As I said, see the, the lecture notes contain a precise reference to Mitchell's book. I mean, there's some sort of finicky details to get straight to, to get this theorem all the way through. Uh, but I'll just sketch the core ingredients. All right. So, uh, so what's the point? Well, let me first do a sketch of the proof sketch. Okay, since then it's, it's an extension, we must have that F bar sends the free module. Well, that's, that's F bar of iota, so that must be F of R, and we're, let's call that B. All right, so F bar has to send the free module to B, and since it preserves co-limits, it in particular preserves all finite, well, all co-products. So if I take a co-product of copies of R, that is any free module, if I had a co-limit preserving extension, well, it would have to have the property that since it preserves co-limits, it must send a free module to just a direct sum of copies of B. Well, then I'm done because every module is a quotient of a map between free modules of arbitrary rank. Okay, and a quotient is a co-kernel, and F bar preserves co-kernels, so there's nothing more to say. All right, so I'll just write that down now. So, given a module M, choose a presentation. Okay, 
R module. So a write R module M. Choose a presentation. So a presentation is an exact sequence. form. Right, so certainly such a thing exists. Uh, I, well, there's more than one, so what I'm going to do is use this choice of presentation to define f bar, and then you have to check, you know, that it's sort of independent of the choices to some degree. Uh, then, So what's the first thing to observe about? So what I want to do is, I mean, I'm trying to define f bar, right? Uh, maybe I'll put it over here. So I want to define f bar as the co-kernel of, given this construction, it's got to be some map between direct sums, or rather co-products of copies of b. In mod S, I know B, I just evaluate F on R, and I can take its co-product. I just need to know what to write down there, and then I define F bar of M to be the co-kernel. All right, so what's the data in alpha? Clearly, I need to use that to construct this question mark. Well, for each I and I, consider the sort of the component, which is so maybe let me name these components with a label. All right, so Ri just means R, similarly for Rj. So I can look at the component of alpha, which is the injection into the coproduct, followed by alpha. Okay, that's fine. But this map here, well, that's an R linear map from R, all right? And, well, so it's just some element here. This is sequences, only finitely many of which are non-zero, right? So um, if you just think about that, you'll see that there must be some finite direct sum. So J and J, I. Okay, so there exists finite J, I contained in J, depending on this index I. This is the inclusion of the sub coproduct, such that this map factors like that. That is to say, just look at the image of that of one here, that's some sequence, pick out all the indices for which the entry in that sequence is non-zero, and collect those into Ji, and then you'll get a factorization like this. So let's call this map alpha sub i. All right. Uh, well, then look at the jth projection for every j in j i. So pi here means the projection. So take the jth projection from that finite direct sum. And this map, it's an R linear map. So it's really just the data of an element. So alpha ij is an element of R. All right. Well, my functor f, if I act on elements of R, I get morphisms, S linear maps from B to B. Right? So this here... It's just the matrix made up of F applied to all the alpha ij's. I mean, alpha ij is an R linear map from R to R, so F of alpha ij is an S linear map from B to B, and then induce first the map into the product. I mean, uh, right, so I mean, only finitely many of them are non zero, so. You can induce the map into the infinite coproduct and then induce the map out of the uh, coproduct. And then take the coconut, and that's the definition of f bar m. 
left, right? So, definition. Yes, curve kernel. All right, so given a choice of presentation, that defines the image of the functor on objects. A morphism of R modules can be lifted to a morphism of presentations, and then in the same way, you get matrices, sort of infinite matrices, but only finitely many entries in each column are non zero. Uh, sort of here and here, and then that introduces a map between the F bars. So in that way, we define a functor, and then, well, it's a little more delicate to check that it preserves co-limits, uh, but you can do this. So check preserves co-limits. Uh, it's clear by construction that it restricts to F. Okay, so I mean, as I said, I'm skipping sort of many sort of more or less tedious checks, but that's how it works. time a co-limit preserving functor out of mod r to mod s which restricts to sending the ring to uh, b. What's the tensor product with b? Right, so the tensor product of a right r module over r with an r s by module is a functor from mod r to mod s because the tensor product, well, using that structure leaves me with an abelian group, but I've still got an S module structure, which makes the resulting tensor product <coughs> a, uh, an S module. Tensor product preserves co-limits, and if I feed in R, well, R tensor of R with B is B. So the tensor product is a co-limit preserving functor, which extends F, and by the uniqueness, which we didn't prove, but which is true, uh, this must be true. Right. Okay, so hence the advertised alternative universal characterization of the tensor product. Before we said universal bilinear map, now we're saying the tensor product is really the universal co-limit preserving extension of something. Okay, so that is the point of view on the tensor product that we're going to use in the more exotic settings in a moment. So will the hypothesis that like, P is a single object mm. still apply? No, that's right, yeah. So in, I mean, in the case we're about to talk about, replacing the category of modules is the category of pre-sheaves on a small category. The small category plays the role of the ring. So it's actually not important that it's a single object. Yeah, that's the, uh, let me make a comment like that. So in fact, in the reference that I just mentioned, this is proved in the context where uh, P is any small additive category. Right? I mean, an additive category with one object is a ring. There's actually nothing special about a single object. Just take a small additive category. It's like a ring with multiple objects. So sometimes people call these ringoids. And the same proof goes through. It's really no different. It's actually very important. Yeah. So I mean, in many cases, you do want to apply it in this generality. Uh, any other questions? So what I want to do now is, I mean, I argued these two were the same using the fact that this satisfied the universal property, right? But our intuition will work better if we can look at this and just see why that quotient has to be the tensor product. Yeah. Um, that will then sort of explain this connection in a way that will be more useful. So let me keep this. Okay, well look at that quotient. I mean, the tensor product you usually constructed as a quotient, right? It's some free module, modulo some relations. So uh, 
have a look at that and sort of see if you can see the same story. So, how would we usually construct M tensor R B? I mean, that's what this thing ultimately is, right? But we, we don't usually write down this construction of the tensor product. We would instead start from take the free abelian group on the set M cross B and we would mod out by the, well first the bilinearity relations, so M plus M prime comma B That's where we'd stop if we hadn't written R there, but since we did, we have to add um, slightly different versions you may have seen. So you ultimately want this to be an so. I mean you could take the free S module on this. And then you would add an additional relation which says if there's a BS inside the bracket, I can take the S outside. Right? In, in the case I've written down, this free abelian group module of these relations has an S module structure, which is sort of a, uh, an after the fact observation rather than being built in. Okay, but this is one way of constructing it. Okay, so a free abelian group modular relations. Well, this is also sort of a free structure in some sense, right? It's really sequences, J-indexed sequences of elements uh, of B. Okay, so... Um, maybe let me write this a slightly different way. So remember, we, we got here by sort of starting with a diagram that looked like the following. Oh, that's not a nice office. Well, that isn't how I wrote that diagram down because I didn't want to say tensor product. I mean, I, I wrote this diagram down by finding the components of alpha and then rereading them as maps on B using F. But I could think about where this co-kernel comes from just by taking alpha and tensoring on the right with B. Okay, and then this, well, the co-product comes outside the tensor product, R tensor RB is B, so I get this, and similarly there, and then just map from alpha is the thing I wrote down uh, before. Okay, so I write this down in order that you see the following description of uh, this top map. That infinite coproduct is generated as an abelian group by symbols that look like that. Right, where this means take the, I mean, you know, it depends how you think about sequences, right? Sequences are functions from I into B. Um, if you think about them as some long list, then the position I in the list has, is the only non-zero position and it has a B in it, right? That denotes, this element denotes 
this notation denotes that element of the coproduct. Uh, and that element gets mapped, if you think about this diagram, to the sum over j, j alpha i j b. I mean, that's just an explicit way of writing what I described as f, that matrix earlier. Now, this means the sequence which has this in position j, but the and this is an element. Uh, this is an element of R, right? But B is a R S bi module, so that's okay. I'm acting on B with the element um, of R. If you like, you could write this in this way, where by this I mean, well, this infinite coproduct. If I take a coproduct of left R modules. Well, I get a left R module, and that's the action. Okay. All right. Okay. So what's the point? The point is this co-kernel presents M R tensor B as a different free module, modulo a different set of relations. as the quotient of the free abelian group. Perhaps I said free R module just then. I meant free abelian group. On, well, these sorts of symbols, right? But uh, these ones, so using J. So on J cross B. Modulo uh, well, the first set of relations I need is that when I write these symbols down, they're sort of additive in B, right? So I better get myself back into that position. So that's J B plus B prime is J B plus J B prime for all B and B prime. Um, oh, I did mean free R module. Yeah, that's a bit of a trick. The reason I need free R module is otherwise I can't really write these relations down using the alpha IJs. Uh, I need this, which identifies the R module structure on the free R module with the R module structure that comes from the Bs. And and so far the structure of M hasn't appeared anywhere. So the structure of M is of course encoded in this matrix alpha, right? The presentation of M. The presentation is exactly telling me generators and relations which present M. So in order to introduce the structure of M into the tensor product, well, I need to use those relations. I mean, in this presentation, they're baked into the, they're baked into, you know, the, the symbols, right? The relations that are present on the M's. is, well, okay, I'm not sure I like what I've written down, but
Okay, so in the presentation of M, I had this surjection from this infinite coproduct. Take the jth, or rather ith. Take the jth basis element, map it there. That's a generator, ej. Whenever I have a relation in M, that is a sequence like this, uh, then mod out by the corresponding relation between the symbols in the free R module and J cross B. Uh, of course, I only need to mod out by the relations which are specified by alpha. Right? So what should I have said instead? Uh, or, I mean, I need all these to be zero, right? Sum over j, alpha i j, j b equals zero for Okay, those two are the same thing, right? So this is some equation in the free R module on j cross b. For each i, Remember, i was the free module which indexed the relations. For each i, I take this equation and mod out by it, and that implements the, gener the relations on these generators which describe m. Uh, okay, so this is how we usually think about the tensor product. This co-kernel presentation is presenting it slightly differently. It's taking b as the given thing. I don't break b into generators and relations. Uh, but I do think about the M in terms of generators and relations. I construct the thing which takes the generators times B, and then I mod out by the relations, which are determined M. All right, so maybe I'll pause there for a minute. Um, okay, so why shift our point of view from this presentation to this one? Well, it's because this is more congruent with the point of view on tensor products as extensions of a functor to co-limit preserving functors. And it's that categorical point of view which will most easily generalize to the non-additive setting of topoi. Okay, so this is, we needed to shift our minds a little uh, in order to accommodate the, the stuff to come. All right, any questions about that? Uh, yeah, I don't really understand why alpha ij doesn't appear in the first presentation. Well, it's sort of, I so mean... describing the curl instead of describing... Well, th that's because this is kind of dumb, right? What am I saying? I'm saying if a relation between generators is true in M, then make it true on these symbols. Right. But any relation between elements in M is generated by these relations. That's what a generators and relations yeah, presentation yeah. means. So. This is just the special case of that where the right-hand side is zero and the left-hand side is just the sort of canonical list of relations. But any equation like that can be generated by these ones. So really they're saying the same thing. Yeah, the second one makes more sense. To yeah, I don't know why I wrote that down in the notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah, I uh, hope that's clear. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah, I've one. So you're trying to write um, F as a. So you're using the fact that F is co limit preserving. Is that why we're trying to write the. I understand why you're putting the work into the code kernel, but I don't really understand the code product. Are you trying to. Yeah. Uh, the co product, you mean. You mean that co product? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so think about it like this. So, so what, what I'm about to say is sort of the, there's various important analogies between the algebraic situation where I have the category of modules and well, that starts from the ring. And here I've got the category of pre-sheaves on a small category, which is starts from the category itself. Well, every R module is a co-limit of a diagram made out of just R. I drew the diagram, right? I take a presentation, that's 
that's a presentation. I mean, that's a description of every module as a co-limit of representable modules, which is namely the ring itself. Okay, so you could sort of, I mean, you can stage this in several ways. Right, first you can take R, and then you can take, you know, either finite free modules and finite co-limits, which will get you the finitely generated modules or finitely presented modules. Um, take free and so on. Yeah. Um, and over here, of course, as you know, every pre-sheaf is a co-limit of a diagram of representable pre-sheaves, which is just the same statement. Um, so that's why if we're talking about co-limit preserving functors out of here, it's really just descript describing data to do with finite free module. through these analogies in more detail now. Given the, the context of these seminars, you know, it's helpful to recontextualize the idea of a presentation of a module as being a kind of algorithm for constructing the module from the basic object, which is the free module. Right? You take some direct sums, and then you take co-kernels, and that's how you construct your object. Uh, okay. and the diagram I just erased, which was direct sum over i of b goes to direct sum co-product rather of a j of b goes to f bar of m. Well, that took that algorithm for constructing m from free modules and sort of executed that algorithm using b instead of r, but using the same construction. Right? And the construction of m was start with r, take a direct sum of an infinite number of copies indexed by i, take this other direct sum indexed by j, take some map, take the co-kernel. If you run that same algorithm, replace r with b, uh, then you're building the module f bar m. All right. So that's sort of the analogy we're going for. Uh, okay, so we're moving to the right-hand column. Okay, so uh, given Owen's question earlier, I already alluded to this. So we can replace a ring by a small additive category. Which would continue to denote P. The non-additive analog of that is just a small category. literally just take the word additive out. It's the non-additive version. Okay, so what's a left R module? Well, in terms of the category P, a left R module is just an additive functor from P to abelian groups. Right? I mean, abelian groups is right Z module, so just run what I said earlier and we get this connection. The analog is a functor from C to sets. Right? So the additive, so in the additive world we have abelian groups, in the non-additive world we have sets. A right R module is of course an additive thing from P op to abelian groups. So a pre-sheaf on a small category is basically a right module. All right, so continuing the table. So that means R mod is the same as sets to the C. Mod R, well not the same, is analogous to. And 
write modules is analogous to this pre-sheaf topos. An RS bimodule, which we knew was an additive functor from P to another module category, is a functor. So it's left R, R was my C, to a module category. The analog of a module category was, right, this is right S modules. If that's, so D is some other small category that plays the role of right D modules. Okay? So a functor like that is the analog of a bimodule. And we've just learned how to think about the tensor product with a bimodule. purely categorical terms, right? It was the ex unique co-limit preserving extension of this functor to a functor from mod R to mod S. So the non-additive version of the tensor product should then be some kind of functor from right, the analog of right R modules, which is sets C op, to That should be the analog of the tensor product with such a functor. Okay, so now I state a theorem saying such things exist. Any questions about the list? By the way, it goes much further than this. So, I mean, what's sort of missing rather obviously here is, well, we know how to localize pre-sheaf topoi, right? We know how to take on set C op a topology and pick out the sheaves. The non-additive version, well, you already know that too, right? You can localize a ring. You take a ring, you take some sort of topology. Um, I mean, either actually a topology generated by an ideal or you take a set of elements you're going to invert. So maybe this is not really the subject of the lecture, but an interesting aside, which is that if I take a ring and invert some collection of elements, modules of a R, S, R with S inverted forms a full subcategory of just modules over R, which is directly analogous to the inclusion of sheaves in pre-sheaves. Okay, I mean, uh, in directly analogous in many senses in the sense that this can be described as a kind of growth and decay topology additive version on the category P, that is the category with one object R. Also, these inclusions have various adjoints, which are also true here. So this is so this analogy extends uh, in many different directions. So the actual, like, like the, the pre-sheaf category arises as the localization of the category, so the sheaf category arises as the localization of the category of pre-sheaves? That's right. Of some, of like some local reward system? Oh yeah, this word localization has various meanings. Uh, in this case, I just mean that the inclusion has a left adjoint. Yeah. Um, so such a thing has got a localizing or co-localizing subcategory. And there's a similar adjunction here. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I mean, that's not just a, a sort of misuse of language. All the localizations, that is, all the subcategories with that property, come from growth and decay topologies. They're sort of a, a sort of bijection of lattices. So they're really the same sort of data. And the same here. So, in fact, there's, it's very interesting, there's more localizations of R than just inverting elements. There's some very strange localizations where they, I mean, that is, there's strange subcategories of mod R which have adjoints and behave very much like localizations but are not obtained uh, in this way. So that's sort of amusing. Okay, so that dotted line, what's the theorem? Thank you.
let C be a small category. And E a co-complete category. A is supposed to be this thing in the second row up there, right? So E is the pre-sheaf category on D, for instance, a functor. There's a unique, again in the same sense, extension, again in the same sense, using your nada, of A to a co-limit preserving functor. So again, what does extension mean? Well, just as the ring sits inside its category of modules, C sits inside the category of pre-sheaves as uh, via your nada. And I want this diagram. <coughs> to commute up to natural isomorphism. I think at least you two guys have read that part of the book, right? Yeah. yeah. OK, so I'll sketch again the construction. Um, so the way the construction is presented doesn't immediately call to mind tensor product. Um, well, and once you unravel it, it's transparently very similar to a tensor product. But Okay, so how would I get this functor A? Well, so let me just define it on objects. So given an object that is a functor P to sets, A of P is a co-limit in E of some diagram. That diagram is a functor which lands in E. Well, have a functor which lands in E, so that would make sense if it was A after something. And this part, I start with the category of elements of P. I'll remind you what that is. So. So the objects, okay, so I'll describe a small category, which is the category of elements, and I'll describe this functor. And then, well, I have a functor, which is a diagram on this category in E. I take its co-limit, that's an object. So at least on the level of objects, that's now a definition once I've described those two ingredients. So the category of elements has as objects pairs, where C is an object of my category, and x is an element in PC. The morphisms from Cx to C prime y are morphisms in C. So P is contravariant, so it sends F to a map from PC prime to PC needs to be such that it sends y to x. And this functor here, star, sends cx to c and f to f. All right, so that's what it does on objects. On morphisms, it's sort of clear. Uh, and then you have to check you know, all the various properties. So it's, it's clear if I put in a representable functor, if you think about it, uh, that I get out A. 
the fact that it preserves co-limits is because co-limits commute with one another, but that's, yeah, so that's a check. But I wonder. Okay, what we need is this description as a co-limit so that we can think about this functor. I mean, if this was A, this is A bar, right? So we're supposed to think about this A bar, in, at least in this case, where E is a pre-sheaf topos itself, as being like a tensor product with A. A is like a bimodule, right? So that's what we now have to figure out, is how to, how to convince ourselves that that's a reasonable sort of intuition. Okay, so that's what I'll do next. Uh, all right. <coughs> uh, okay, so where were we? Uh, a, so the analogy was that A was supposed to be like a left, well, like a bimodule, right? So if A was, so C was like my ring, and if E was sets D op, well, that was right modules, sort of like right S modules. So this was a functor from the ring as a analogous to the f a functor from the ring as a one object category to right S modules, which was the same as a bimodule. And then this thing, by analogy, we want to think of as a tensor product. Well, I mean, okay, there's a suggestive analogy, but uh, let's, to, to make it into more than just a suggestive analogy, we need to analyze that co-limit diagram and see if we really believe in this intuition. Right? So that's what we now do. Okay, so to analyze that co-limit, we have to remind ourselves about how we construct co-limits from co-products and co-equalizers. So that's this aside. So, uh, given a diagram, uh, I've called it F in the notes, I think that's okay. Okay, that's a curly I, I for diagram, that's the category where I'm supposed to be taking my co-limit. X has co-limits. Can be presented as a co-equalizer of the following form. All right, so here's the co-limit. to write two maps, right? Okay, so the object which goes here is the coproduct over all the vertices in the diagram of the corresponding object. And here is the coproduct over all arrows in the diagram. And what I put is F I. Okay, I mean, associated to F, there's two vertices, and there's two possible objects I could put down, F I or F I prime, but it's F I, that is F of the domain. All right, let me name this copy of F I with this label. So I'm going to describe two maps, I'll call them pre and post. Uh, okay, so to describe those, I need to describe their components, right? Okay, so that's the canonical morphism into the coproduct. I just need to give you two maps indexed. So for each F, I need to give you two maps from this guy to that coproduct in order to determine two maps pre and post. Okay, so 
pre is just, well, this fi is fi. So that's the identity, it goes to fi. And then I take the morphism, which is the canonical map, into the coproduct. So that's one map indexed by f, and that determines, that's the components of the map pre. I could also use f of f. That goes to f of i prime, and then I take the canonical map into the coproduct. That collection of maps gives you all the components of post. All right. So that's two maps, and then I take the co-equalizer, and it's transparent. That's the co-limit, right? Because the co-equalizer is the universal map, which gives you the same thing when you compose with these two. Composing with these two things being the same, well, that's a map out of a co-product, so it's the same as all the components being the same. But that is to say that 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 equals that 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 for every f, which is to say that it's a co-cone. So the co-equalizer is the universal co-cone, that is, it's the co-limit. Okay, so that's absolutely clear that that is a way of writing down the co-limit. Okay, so that's recollection one. Uh, recollection two Look, I said it earlier, right, that every module is a co-limit of a diagram made up of just the ring. Uh, similarly, every pre-sheaf is a co-limit of a diagram made up of representable pre-sheaves. We haven't discussed that fact in the seminar so far. Maybe we should do that at some point. But, uh, uh, well, I can tell you what the diagram is. So I take that same, I mean, it's the thing inside the brackets there, but without the A, right? Okay, so take a pre-sheaf, that's a diagram. Goes from the category of elements, I take the canonical functor to C, then I sit C inside pre-sheaves, so that's a diagram in the category of pre-sheaves. The co-limit of that diagram is P. Okay. Um, and if you sort of, that is the non-additive version of taking a module and taking every single element as a generator, right? So that's the dumbest way to present a module as a quotient of a free module, right? You just take every single element as a generator, take the huge direct co-product over all those sort of freely generating elements, and then map each element as a basis element to itself in the module. That's that, if you think about it. Okay, so it's not the most economical way, necessarily, of presenting a pre-sheaf as a co-limit of representable pre-sheaves, but it works. Okay, so, so what we're doing is trying to read this equation in a way that makes sense as a tensor product. So I'm going to keep the equation. So the plan is, after we've learned to think about this A bar as a genuine tensor product in some reasonable sense, then we're going to apply this construction to the special case where E is the category of topological spaces, that's a co-complete category, and C is the simplex category, so that A is a, sim well, A will be the n simplices, the canonical n simplices, and then P will be a simplicial set. So then we'll look at this construction and we'll see that this co-limit is geometric realization. That's sort of the amazing, uh, beautiful connection between all these ideas. All right, so recall the pre-sheaf P is a co-limit, which means it is a co-equalizer. This the full context. So C is a category. 
A was any functor from C to E. P was a pre-sheaf, and then that's that. Okay, well, we just reminded ourselves that any co-limit, in particular that co-limit, is a co-equalizer, so let's write down what that co-equalizer is. So it lands in P, which is the co-limit. Here I need to put the co-product over every vertex in the diagram. That is, over every object in this category. That is, over pairs C comma X. Those are all the objects. So this co-product is indexed by objects and elements of P of C. And here I put the image under this functor, right, the Fi, which means I take the C comma X, which is my I, and I evaluate F on it. That is, I send it over here. So it goes to C, and then it goes to the representable pre-sheaf HC. So this is HC. Uh, here are two maps. Here, so that should be the co-product over all arrows in my diagram, that is, all morphisms in this category. So that is over all morphisms That's the data of a morphism in that category. It's C, C prime, X, Y, and an F satisfying this condition. Okay. And here I need to put F of the domain of the arrow, which is CX. CX again goes to, goes to HC. All right. Well, you'll notice actually the X is redundant here, right? because x is determined by y and f. So I don't need to include, I mean, I could, I could erase that and erase that condition if I liked. It would be the same indexing set. That'll come up uh, later. Okay. Um, right, so. Well, I mean, I don't need to say it this way exactly. Uh, okay, so what's the difference between, yeah, let me say it slightly differently to what I said in the notes. So we're trying to understand this co-limit, right? Well, what we've just done is present that co-limit on the top board as a co-equalizer in sets C op. This diagram, which is in uh, E, right? Well, what's the diagram that it's the co-limit of? It's basically the same diagram, right? Except here I send C into representable things, and here I just applied A instead, right? So, okay, you're not supposed to have any particular emotive attachment to these two maps at the moment. Okay, but in a second, we'll th think about these in a, in a more uh, conceptual way. Uh, but for the moment, we just want to observe that, well, P is the co-equalizer co here. For the same reason, A bar P is another way to present that co-limit is as a co-equalizer. It's the co-equalizer of basically the exact same thing. And in fact, I won't rewrite the rest. So C is just an object. X is an element in PC. But instead of HC, which is the image of the under the Yonator of C, I put AC. Right? And here I put the co-product index by F, 
comma y. As I said, I can omit the x, right? So it's indexed by morphisms in C and a y in PC prime. And here I put again AC. And I've got those two maps. Remember the data, which I mean, defining these two arrows boils down to just thinking about, well, in that case, f of little f. In this case, it will be a applied to f, right? a is a functor from c to e. This is a morphism in c. I apply a to it, I get a morphism in e. And those are the components that make up this, these two arrows here. And then I take the co-equalizer in e. All right. Okay, so. But now looking at this, we see generators and relations, right? I mean, recall the construction that I had earlier, which was M tensor RB. That was a co-kernel of direct sum over j and j b, direct sum over i and i b. And then there was some map there. That map was constructed out of the presentation of m. Right? So we learned to think of the tensor product as generated by generators like this, subject to various relations. I mean, a co-kernel is really a co-equalizer of some non-zero map and, and the zero map, right? So that's a co-equalizer. So is this. So we should think of this as giving generators and these two maps as telling us relations. The role of zero is played by the thing which is just identities everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so it's like relations in a group where on the right-hand side there's an identity rather than... I mean, in an abelian group you have relations where there's zero but in a group group, you know, which is multiplicative, you have relations with a one, right? So that's the analog here. Okay, so these are gonna be, we think of the element, elements here as generators. And well, these things here index relations and the maps here are telling us what the relations are. Okay, so let's, let's see what that says then as a generators and relations presentation of a bar of p. And then once I've said that, we'll see why that's in the case where E is topological spaces, basically just telling us how to assemble simplices to build up topological spaces. thing here I mean I don't know how you like to write disjoint unions but I like to write them as tuples um, indexed so the first element of a tuple is an index right so disjoint union is well got two indices these things and then an actual element which I'll call so where C is an object of C, X is an element in PC, and A is an element in AC. I mean, that's by definition what this disjoint, well, uh, I mean, disjoint unions are co-products in the category of sets, right? E could be some crazy category in which, you know, the co-product 
doesn't look anything like disjoint unions, right? So uh, I have to be a bit careful about what I mean here. Maybe I'll just say in sets. But this will also literally be true in the category of topological spaces. So the category of topological spaces is co-complete and co-limits are just, com well, co-products are just disjoint unions with the natural topology, even infinite ones. So, um, so let me say E equals sets and E equals topological spaces. So in, in top, the underlying set of the co-product, so if A of C is a topological space, the underlying set is just the disjoint union. Um, but this is not, I mean, this intuition is not useless outside these examples because remember, we're often thinking, I mean, the other canonical case where was E was itself a pre sheaf topos, right? And in a pre sheaf topos, co limits are computed point wise. So, I mean, it really does look like a disjoint union just indexed by the objects of that category D. So, okay, this is still sort of a valid intuition. Right, so if E is sets and E is or E is topological spaces, it's literally this collection of elements. Moreover, the co-equalizer in sets of two maps is just the quotient of the sort of right-hand object by the smallest equivalence relation generated. Right, so. so in sets or in topological spaces, the co-equalizer is y modulo the smallest equivalence relation generated by f of x is equivalent to g of x for all x in x. Right. So that means that uh, the co-equalizer takes this set and imposes the small, I mean, the equivalence relation generated by the following relations, which is for every element here. So that is for every f and y. So that gives me the co complete collection of indices and an element, which we'll call what a. So we, we take, so f comma y comma a is an element here. I apply both of these maps separately. Pre doesn't do anything. Um, uh, post composes, I mean, applies a of f, right? So the relation I get out is that c, p, f, y. Well, I said this is pre. I said pre doesn't do anything, uh, but this is really x. Right? I mean, the index there had an x in it. I, I dropped the x because it was redundant, could be determined by f and y. So pre doesn't really do anything, it's just giving you x, but x was pf of y. And that's a, that's equivalent to c, y, p, f of a. Sorry, a, f. That's c prime. Okay, so that's the relations which generate. And you should think of this as C comma, I mean, the way that Patrick was writing it in his last lectures, for instance, if you have a pre-sheaf, you think of F as acting on Y, right? So let's think about that as Y dot F, let's say. That's A, C prime Y. Now, why do I write it on this side? Or P, that's like a right module, right? That was the analogy before. So I write the action. I mean, remember a module sent the, the thing on the left was P op. P, curly P was the category with just one object, which was the ring. That sent elements to their action. The element, I mean, the morphisms. The morphisms in this case are the Fs, the morphisms in C, but we still think of them as acting and we write them on the right. In this case, A 
was a functor from C to E. That's like a left module. So we write the action on the left. OK, so the conclusion is that AP is a quotient of the set of these sort of generators, C, X, A, by the relations star. Right, because this was the co-equalizer, and I've just presented the set and the relation that generates the co-equalizer. Okay. So in this sense, A bar P is like the tensor product of, well, I mean, we mod out by the relation which moves the action of F across to the other side of the tuple. In the ring case, we only had one object in the source category, right? Which is why we didn't have an index there. Uh, but now we've got multiple objects. So this is like tensoring the right module P over C is like our ring with the left module A. So that's the sense in which this co-limit preserving extension is very much like a non-additive tensor product. Okay, so now we'll do simplicial sets. And any questions about that part? All right, so simplicial sets. Okay, so E is the category of topological space. This is not a topos, right? Um, so this is not an example in the direction of topos theory, but it is an example which explains, well, uh, okay, I'll get to that later, I guess. Okay, so that's code complete. So ultimately, we're interested in the following kind of situation, right? So, uh, right, this was the, yeah. Um, and so what I'm saying here is think. So, well, sorry, the other way around. So remember this, uh, okay, so let's put it like this. So sets D op, sets C op. Well, that's not, I mean, well, these are at least both topoi, right? So to understand this kind of functor in a geometric morphism between two topoi, which arises from the universal property, um, the construction of this is basically analogous to the construction of this kind of functor, um, which is A bar. Right? So given an A, which is from C to sets D op, getting the A bar will be part of a geometric morphism. Um, and so if we can understand A bars and how to think about them, then we can understand these F bars because they're constructed in just the same way. So in general, we think about the left adjoint part of a geometric morphism as being a tensor product. And if we can understand how to think about its action on objects and arrows, uh, then we're in a good situation in the logical context, which I originally started the talk. And the key to doing that is to understand, I mean, here I can put any E, right? Well, modulo the fact that if I put any E there, the coproduct becomes maybe stranger. Uh, 
And the co-equalizer is also something a bit stranger, but that's not such a big issue, I think. So to understand this situation, it sort of suffices to understand this. And then top behaves very much like sets in the sense that it's co-product and co-equalizer are like sets. So to understand the construction which induces these kinds of left adjoints, uh, I think all the conceptual content is contained in the case that we're about to discuss, really. Okay. Yeah, but you can fix that. So there, there are topoi which have all topological spaces in them. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's fixable. So what are we doing? We want to understand, this is an example of that construction. The ingredients in that construction were two things, right? Well, three, I guess, four. <laughs> <coughs> we had E, we had A, which is a functor from C to E, and we had P, which was a functor from uh, C op. And then the construction was A bar P, which we should think about as that tensor product. Okay, so now we're fixing E to be top. We're going to fix C to be the simplex category. So let's C. i.e. the objects of C are just natural numbers, uh, usually written with square brackets. Well, so given natural number, let in the brackets be the partially ordered set whose elements are integers less than, non-negative integers less than or equal to n with the natural partial order. Uh, and then arrows in this category from, which one am I writing, n or n? I think I'm usually writing in for the left one. Well. Okay, that is their functions between these two sets which preserve the inequality. Uh, Another way to say that is that's the set of all functors. A partially ordered set is a category, and that's exactly the set of all functors between those two categories. Anyway, whichever way you want to think about it, that's the simplex category. So that's going to be our C. So I still need to fix an A. Sorry, uh, I mean an A and a P. Simplicial set is just a contravariant functor from the simplex category to sets. Um, that doesn't on its face have much topological content. Um, and I'll explain in a second a more sort of elementary way to generate simplicial sets so that we have an understanding of this topologically. Okay, so that's going to be our P. Right? That is, a, a simplicial set is exactly a P. So I still need an A. Okay, so 
So what's A? A needs to send, needs to pick for every non-negative integer a topological space, and for every non-decreasing function a continuous map. Uh, well, for those I just take the canonical simplices. So A of n delta V n is just the convex hull of n plus 1 points. Uh, with the subspace topology inside Rn plus 1, right? So delta 0 is just the singleton. It's the element 0, element 1 in R1. Delta 1 is just this line in R2, and so on. So delta 2 is, you know, Two simplex, so zero simplex, zero because it's zero dimensional, one simplex because it's one dimensional. It sits inside, so the n simplex sits inside Rn plus one. Well, that's a sequence of topological spaces. Now I need to define for you a sequence of continuous maps. So this is going to be fixed somehow, right? So we fix our A and we consider any P and then we're going to form this tensor product. That tensor product is supposed to be a topological space. So by fixing A, we're going to associate to any simplicial set functorially a topological space. And what else could it be but the geometric realization? So as a functor, so given an f from n to m, so a f well delta n, the n simplex sits inside R n plus one. This set has n plus 1 elements in it. So that is really the free vector space generated by that set. Well, the free vector space is a functor, right? It's the left adjoint of the forgetful functor from vector spaces to sets. So apply that functor. That is a linear map between these two vector spaces, and therefore it's continuous in this usual topology. And if you check, that restricts to a map like that. So that's AF, and given the way I've presented it, it's clearly a functor. Okay, so that's the functor. All right, by the theorem, A, which is this canonical functor, uh, extends uniquely to a co-limit preserving functor A bar. understand. I mean, the hard work we did to present A bar of P in terms of sort of generators and relations, so to speak, let's apply this, apply that in this special case to see how we should understand. I mean, that's defined as some co-limit. So what is that topological space? 
we have a way of thinking about it. Let's just read it out in this case. So that means we need to feed in a simplicial set that is the data of some functor. That seems like a lot of information. So let's give ourselves a simpler way of generating simplicial sets, uh, so, which is a simplicial complex. So I recall. Did you guys do simplicial complexes in the deployment? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll be brief then, so. Cool. I think I'm the only one. Sorry? I think I was the only one that did that assumption. Oh, really? <laughs> last thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then when I just did that assumption. Okay, so a simplicial complex is a collection of, sort of think of a polyhedron, it's a collection of vertices in the polyhedron, right? Which, so if you have a polyhedron, think of you know, tetrahedra stuck to each other in some complicated way. Not every collection of vertices circum circumscribes a face, for instance, right? But some of them do. Take just those subsets which circumscribe a face or a solid filled in part, if it's you know, more than three vertices. Those are the sets which make up the simplicial complex. So it's a set K of non-empty subsets of a set K bar. Okay, so K bar you think of as a set of vertices of that complicated construction. K is just those which circumscribe solid bits. Such that if X is in K and Y is a subset of X, then Y is also in K. Well, that makes sense. If you've got a filled tetrahedron which is inside your space, well, then all the faces are also inside the space, right? That's what that says. If Y is a subset and Y is non empty, then it's in K. All right. So, example. This is the example we're going to apply the actual description of A bar P to, because it's simple enough to actually do. two simplicial complexes on K bar. So K, K triangle has the following set of subsets. Well, that uniquely specifies it, right? If the entire thing is in it, then every subset is in it, every non-empty subset. And that corresponds to just taking the that's what I'm thinking about when I write down this set. If I just, if I don't want the interior, I just leave out this part, right? So I'm taking 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 2, 0, There's no topological space, right? It's just a collection of subsets, but that's what you're supposed to think about. So clearly that's supposed to be zero, and that's supposed to be one, that's supposed to be two, that's zero one, that's one two, that's zero two. In this case we have all those plus zero one two, which is the face. Okay, so given those sets, how would you generate that topological space? Well, just take the convex hull. So. Okay, so take the free vector space on K bar. K 
case is R3, right? So that means I've got basis element 0, 1, 2, and then take the union over all the simplices. Okay, so elements are called simplices. Take the union over all the simplices of the convex hull of sigma. That is, all linear combinations of things in sigma whose coefficients are non-negative and which add up to a number less than or equal to 1. So then I get this. Ah, oh, sorry. Add up to 1. Yeah. Uh, okay, and in this case, so that I get the face. Uh, so this is bar k. Is that topological space with the subspace topology. And that clearly works here too. So that's a geometric realization. All right. Okay, so that's a simplicial complex. That's very intuitive. Associated that is a simplicial set. So for simplicity, let's just assume k bar is partially ordered. I mean, of course, I can put a partial order on it if I want. Uh, but I mean, in this case, you know, it comes to us partially ordered. So let's, let's think we're in that situation. And I want to define a simplicial set, which means I want to define a functor objects of that category are integers, that is supposed to be the n simplices. simplex is supposed to be an n-dimensional thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. right. To get a line, I need two things in my simplex, right? Okay, so that's n plus one. Okay. So, uh, right. So a simplicial complex is a set of simplices of various dimensions. And that should be the set, roughly speaking, of n simplices. That's the idea. But I've got a partial order. The point is that simplices are unordered, they're just sets. Right? Um, given a partial order, I can put in bijection. I mean, that's the same as giving them in order. Right? I just want to remember them as sets. Okay, so that's the same as saying the set of all n simplices. Okay, and then uh, I didn't actually say they were ordered. But I mean, otherwise I'd have all the permutations in there as well. Right? Okay, so that's the functor on objects. But now we need for every arrow in delta, that is every non-decreasing function between these posets, bracket n and bracket m, I need to give you a function. Well, this is important because these are the f's which we're going to have in the relation which tells us the tensor product, right? Sort of f acting on the right on the left part of the tensor is f acting on the left on the right part of the tensor. The f's are the morphisms in the category C 
the category C is delta, right? So we better understand how our functor, so this is going to be our P, right? This guy here. Right, remember the tensor product we're eventually forming is A tensor over C with P. In this case, C was delta. A was a right module, which is a functor from the was P tensor A, right? A bar P was P tensor A. That was the formula. P is going to be SK. A is what I just described. It's the sort of canonical simplices. So SK is a right module over delta generated by a simplicial complex K. And we're going to form the tensor product. OK, so given F, we need to define SKF. Well, that's uh, sort of irritating. Um, so I'm not going to do it. What we do instead is we know, so we prove separately that all the morphisms in delta can be canonically constructed out of some small set of sort of canonical maps. And that means I only need to define SK on those maps. And moreover, in the relations which generate this tensor product, it's also enough to consider those maps because all the other ones are composed out of them. So we just consider these generating morphisms in this entire story. And they are the following. So this is that set. So epsilon i is the guy who misses i. Right. Eta i. these diagrams mean, right? A to I is the guy who collapses I and I plus one. So for every, I mean, with the N and the I is appropriately indexed as max, you know, and maximally for which they make sense, that's a collection of arrows in delta. And every arrow in delta can be written as a composite of a sequence of such maps. All right. So let me just say what SK of epsilon i and SK of eta i are. I mean, SK is contravariant, right? It's an op there. So SK sends A to I to the opposite thing. So let's try that story again. Right, it sends an n-dimensional thing sitting inside your space to an n minus one-dimensional thing. Okay indexed by i. So that's clearly taking a line, giving you the vertices, or taking a face, giving you the edges. Right? So there's the vertices which describe 
the sort of outside of my n-dimensional thing, and I'm going to just omit the ith vertex. Uh, so this is called the face operator. Okay, from the description I just gave, it's clear why. Okay, so I just have to say what happens to eta. Eta doesn't really do anything. Si, which is sk of eta i, goes from sk of n to sk of n plus 1, and it just repeats the ith vertex in my simplex. So a0, n. All right, so nearly there. All right, so a bar was this functor from simplicial sets, which is sets delta op to topological spaces. And we're supposed to think of A bar of P, as I said, I just erased it, was P tensor over C with A. So A bar of SK, which is our P, is supposed to be this tensor product, right? Okay, so let's just run the construction that we had earlier of, right, so remember A bar by definition of SK was some colimit, right, this was the unique extension of A, A remember was the functor from delta into top, which picked out the canonical simplices, right, the point, the edge, the triangle and so on that extends uniquely to a co-limit preserving functor A bar. The value of that co-limit preserving functor on some presheaf, namely the presheaf we obtained from a simplicial complex, is some co-limit. And then we learned how to rewrite that co-limit as a co-equalizer. And the result was that we saw that this was equal to some collection of sort of so-called generators, which looked, remember, the generators looked like CXA before, where C was an object of the category C, or C is delta. So that looks like an N. The next thing was an X, right? So CXA were the things that were the set we were modding out by to construct the co-equalizer. C was an object of C. X was something in PC, right? P was the right module, which is my simplicial set. Okay, so X, um, right, so N is an integer, X is an element of, so, so to speak, PC, which means SKN, so that is X is an N simplex. And A, a was an element of A of C, the value of the right, the left module, so to speak, on C, which is A of N. But A of N, remember by definition, was the canonical or the standard N simplex. All right, so that's the set of, I mean, Remember, the co-equalizer in topological spaces were constructed just for sets. So this is the underlying set of a topological space, which is the, uh, so you topologize it as the disjoint union. But anyway, the underlying set is the set of all those tuples. Modulo some relations. Let's 
run through what those relations look like in the special case of the simplicial complex for the triangle. But you can, you can see what we're doing, right? We're taking a bunch of copies of the standard simplices and we're gluing them together. How are we gluing them? Well, we're gluing them using the structure of SK. That is, we're using the structure of the simplicial complex K. talking about this in the general case, but it'll be clear just from considering this guy. Okay, so if you look at the definition that I had of this simplicial complex before, the associated simplicial set, so that needs to be zero simplices, which are just the vertices, and I say circle, it's topologically the circle, but I just mean this thing. Right? So that's the zero simplices, the one simplices, so they need to be, by the definition of SK, ordered sequences of length two, for which the associated set belongs to the simplicial complex. So those are just the edges. Well, not quite the edges, just the edges, I mean. There's more stuff there, right? Because zero, no, these are not just sets. These were sequences, remember? The simplicial complex was a set of ordered tuples. So I get repeats as well. Okay. These simplices which have a repeat we call degenerate. Now SKN, if N is bigger than one, this would be sets of n plus one elements whose underlying uh, sequences of n plus one elements whose underlying set belongs to K, but they must contain a repeat, right? Because the biggest set which is in K is just the edges, which only has two elements. So um, as every sequence degenerate. Which is to say that every element here is obtained from one of these by just sticking in repeats some number of times. All right. Okay, so what does this construction say then? It says A bar SK is, well, remember the first two things they were inde indexing a disjoint union. So let me write that back again. So it's the disjoint union over all N and X of, well, the A's form delta N. That's another way of writing that set. Right? So I get for every zero simplex a copy of delta zero. So let's say delta zero, disjoint union delta zero, disjoint union delta zero. And let's label them with the corresponding simplex. And I get three copies of delta one. And then, I mean, three more, which are degenerate, which I won't write. Okay, so there's, I mean, there's three more copies of delta one, and then tons of copies of delta two, and then tons of copies of delta three, and it just never stops. Uh, but the equivalence relation kills all those extra copies that sort of don't, so they don't contribute anything. Uh, that's what the f degeneracy maps the eighters are for. I don't, you know, we won't go into that. Let's just focus on these six things that actually count. So what is the relation doing? All right. So. Let's give maybe one example of the relation. 
So remember the relations in general. The relations look, so this A bar of P looked like the infinite co-product over CXs of AC modulo a relation. The relation looked like C Y F comma A is the same as C Y F A, right? Where this meant the right module, which is the P, and this meant the left module, which is the A. Oh, sorry, that's supposed to be uh, my X's and Y's got mixed up, I guess. Anyway. All right, so what's this, what's that relation read here? I mean, this, that was a C prime, right? So F, C to C prime. I think that's right. So that relation here, for instance, reads, I mean, we get one relation. We get a relation for every F and every Y. Right? So in this case, the Fs are morphisms in the simplex category. And I only need to count the Fs which are of the form eta i. So let's think about eta 0, or eta 1. That's the first one I have written down there. So let's take an F, which is eta 1. And we'll take for our Y, 0, 1, which is in SK. And then the A will have to be, so what's the relation? The relation is 0, 0, A in delta 0 is put equal to 1, comma, 0, 1, comma, A of epsilon 1 of A in delta 1. All right, so that's 0. X is in SK0. Yes, that's my X, right? It's this thing there. A is in delta 0, okay. 1, then I have to have something which is in SK1, yes. And then something which is in delta 1. And it's A of epsilon 1 of A. And what's the picture for that? Well, okay, so let's draw 2 maybe. So 0, 1. A in delta 0. I mean, this is just a point. There's only one element there. And here is 1, 0, 1. A epsilon 0. So this is epsilon 1 acting on the left on A. right? That's this thing. This is what I get by applying... So this is P of epsilon 1 of 0, 1. What's P of epsilon 1? P is SK. What does SK do to epsilon 1? Well, that's the map which deletes the f I mean, there was A0 and A1 goes to A0. That's what epsilon 1 did, right? So it deletes the 1. In this case, this is epsilon 0, so it deletes the 0. So this thing here is the right action of F on Y. OK, so what do those two relations say? They say we've taken the disjoint union of a bunch of points and lines. Those two relations glue two of the points onto one of the lines. All right, so those two relations are So this is, I've got three copies of delta 1, well, many, many more in fact, but this is the copy which is indexed by well, 0, 1, right? And what I've done is I've identified the thing on the left here, which is just a point of delta 0, well, there's only one point in delta 0. Uh, 
I've identified it with that point of delta 1. That's what the first equivalence relation says. This is the copy of delta 0 indexed by 1. I identify the single point of that with the point of delta 1 indexed by 0, 1, which is a epsilon 0 of a, which is just that guy, if you work it out. OK, so those two relations do this gluing, and then the remaining relations glue, so that's delta 0. OK, so this is delta 1, 0, 2. There's a relation which glues the same copy of delta 0 that was glued onto this endpoint of delta 1, 0, 1, onto an endpoint of delta 1, 0, 2, which is what hooks those two intervals together, and then so on. Right? So the relations end up precisely gluing together points and lines to make the uh, topological space, which was described earlier as the geometric realization. OK, so upshot. A bar, which was the unique co-limit preserving extension of the standard simplex, simplices thought of as a functor, is geometric realization. Of course, I'm not proving that, but that's what's suggested by this example and what's actually true. Okay, well, which is to say that geometric realization as a functor, you can think of it as, well, this is A bar. A bar was, do I have the formula still? A bar of P, we could think of as P tensor A, right? So geometric realization is therefore P, which is, so. I put in this simplicial complex. The geometric realization is really a tensor product. You take the simplicial set associated to the simplicial complex, you tensor it over my C, which is the simplex category, with the canonical n simplices. All right. So uh, geometric realization is a tensor product, and the left adjoints of geometric morphisms between classifying topoi are all of this form. They're constructed as things that look like tensor products. And you should think of them as being analogous to geometric realizations. Okay, sort of constructing things out of these elementary pieces according to an algorithm which is specified by the input datum, in this case, a simplicial complex. Okay. Well, I think that is more than enough. Okay, thanks, guys. Let's stop. Right, questions?